Nerd Night number 52. The future is non-human. Examples of the comic book mutant, cyborg, and alien. So, as you've heard, I am a comic scholar. Um, I am a PhD student here at the University of Michigan in the Department of American Culture. Shout out to my cohort mates. <laughs> Got lots of support in the audience today. Um, yeah, so loosely, I talk about comics. Um, I think they're just a really cool site that can kind of explore different things like industry and access to industry and who gets to make money and who doesn't and how you can talk about intersections of like race and gender and power and all these cool dorky things. Um, but there are three categories that are really reoccurring in comics, specifically in superhero comics, and that's the mutant, the cyborg, and the alien. So that's what I want to talk about. So before I start, <laughs> I kind of want to get a feel for the audience. So when I say like comic books and comic book characters, what do we think about? Like, just shout out some answers. Superman. Superman. What am I hearing? Shout out some other characters. Garfield. Garfield. I actually told my family that I would hear Garfield. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Lumberjanes. Yeah, Lumberjanes. Nice. Awesome. Archie. Okay. Silver Surfer. Silver Surfer. Cool. So we're getting a wide range, but a lot of people, maybe not this crowd, but a lot of people when you hear comic books, they traditionally think superheroes. So that's definitely where I'm going to start. Um, because superheroes can take a lot of forms, and it's kind of important to think about categorizations when you're thinking about something this huge. Um, so you can see a nice mashup here of some Marvel and a little DC, maybe. But, all right, so the first category I want to talk about is the mutant. And so, yeah, I love mutants. <laughs> um, I don't want to think of mutant in this really traditional, like, Marvel sense, like the mutant, but think about powered people and powered human beings and non-humans that have a mutation and that's where they exist with their power, right? So one classic character is Spider-Man. And as I'm sure we all know, he was bitten by a radioactive spider, as you are, and amazingly woke up the next day or in over the course of the week with spider-like powers. So extra strength, climbing ability, shooting web, spidey sense, all of that. And so this is kind of an indication of a classic mutation. And again, they, I don't know that they would, Marvel would call this a mutation, but it is a mutation of the body, a mutation of power. Um, in that it's an accident, it's science gone wrong or right, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and so this is pretty classic. Another classic one that can kind of be a little more wrong than right, depending on the series, <laughs> is the Hulk. So his origin story is also science kind of gone wrong and an accident kind of exploding in your face. In his instance, he was a scientist that got caught in a gamma ray blast um, or gamma bomb blast. I forget how they actually referenced it. But um, something that most people don't know is originally he was actually this smaller gray character that only transformed at night, kind of like a werewolf. He wasn't furry, I don't think, but um, eventually he turned bigger and green and we got the Jekyll and Hyde kind of character that was transforming because of testosterone and anger and fear and rage, right? So this is another indication of how science and mutation can happen. So does anybody know who this is? It's Marvel. Yeah. So this is not Marvel. This is DC or the DC universe with Vertigo, I believe, is an imprint. Um, but he's a really cool example, again, of science gone wrong. This is like a really reoccurring theme here. Um, science is dangerous, but also he could save the world. Um, so he was a scientist. He was playing around with this special serum that could grow plants exponentially. And then his nemesis exploded his lab, and he got caught on fire with the serum, jumped into the swamp, and then emerged swamping. And later, um, of course, his origin story gets a little more complicated with being the avatar of the green. That might be a little too dorky. But, <laughs> but he's really cool because he's the site of exploring what humanity means to the earth, like how it means to be connected to something that's larger than just human, right? So he's got human memories, he's got human love and relationship, but he is actually, again, to use a really dorky term, the avatar of the green. And his stories are often intricately linked to damage to the earth, to threats to the earth, and he at times chooses the earth over humanity, 
but in doing so is actually saving humanity. So um, he's one of my favorites. I love him. <laughs> okay, and so this is more classic, right? The X-Men. They are the mutants. And so, of course, with them, this isn't a change in um, circumstance or technology gone wrong or science experiments gone wrong, but they were actually born different. They're born with the X gene, the mutant gene, and when they hit puberty or go through a serious experience, they transform um, in a very ways. Um, does anybody have a favorite mutant out of this? Storm. Yeah, right? Storm's the best. I was actually going to have like a whole thing on Storm and I decided I didn't have time. But <laughs> um, yeah, so they can control weather. They can shoot lasers out of their eyes. They've got bone claws that are turned to metal claws and healing powers and ice powers and all of this. And all of this is a, really an exploration of what human, humanity um, through these physical manifestations can really mean. And like, you can get really ethical with it. Like, is the non-mutants humanity a threat to what humanity could be? Or are they a threat to humanity? And what does otherness mean? And it gets really academic and dorky if I am drinking and I'm talking about it. But, um, I won't do that to you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the X-Men are my favorite um, when it comes out of the Marvel Universe, and I think they've got a long history of having these kind of conversations that can be really cool. Okay, so the next category is Cyborg. And I want to say, we get real like, serious with it, Cyborg can mean a lot more things, but what we're going to look at today is the kind of classic Cyborg, which means human mixed with technology. Um, so one of the better examples of this is actually the character Cyborg. <laughs> they went real creative with this one. <laughs> um, but as you can see, he is a very strong person, and he's half human, half machine, and he's got the flag in the background. So this is actually a good indicator of something that I see often in Marvel and DC universes when they're thinking about human and technology merging is they're like, human as an actual weapon. And what does that mean for the US government and militarization? <laughs> and sometimes the writers get really like meta with it. And that's cool, but usually it's just like, the US is a good military might and here is a body that can explore this. Um, but uh, here's another interesting thing about this is, this is DC and he was created in the 1980s. Um, and this guy, whose name is Deathlock, is created by Marvel in the 1970s. So this is a good example of how, I don't want to see Marvel and DC steal from each other. <laughs> um, but they do. <laughs> but they share ideas and concepts, and they have a nice competitive, fun, not so fun history sometimes. So Deathlock is interesting. In the, 19, sorry, in the 1970s, he's actually his name was actually just this uh, category of cyborg. So if a human died and then the US government <laughs> brought him back with Deathlock, uh, cybernetic technology, he was called Deathlock and he was literally a tool for the US military. In his current rendition, um, he can be seen in Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Anybody watching that? Yeah, yeah? I love it, I actually really do. Um, and so he gets really, He's a good source to explore autonomy, um, bodily like use by a larger power like the government or by an evil power. Um, yeah, and he's a really, really cool character and I think he gets a lot more interesting in the actual show than he did in the comics before. Um, but yeah, those are both prime examples of Cyborg. So another really popular one is Iron Man, one of the originals, right? Um, and he came out of a time of like sci-fi and comics having a lot of uh, overlap. Um, and so they were thinking of technology and humanity and what that means for the future, and they're all like terrified of it. And eventually, um, Iron Man, it wasn't just his suit, but he was also had his, currently has an implant um, that actually mon or, like, <coughs> keeps him alive. So he is physically part man, part machine. Um, yeah, and so, if you guys are really into the ser the shows and well, I mean the franchise at this part point, um, you know that Tony Stark has a lot of like conflicting emotions about his technology because it keeps him alive, but then it's also like used to bomb countries, <laughs> and he like swears off of it and then comes back. And I'm not I'm not actually giving spoilers at this point. I think you guys all know this, but yeah. So 
cyborgs are often these spaces to like think through what it means for humanity and machine to be mixed. Um, what is the potential fallout for that? What's the potential goodness of that? Yeah. So the last category is the alien. And I'm just going to say there is so much more out there, but I'm again sticking with Marvel and DC for this first part. Um, aliens in comics are oftentimes the bad guy, but sometimes they're not, as in yeah. Superman. <laughs> so Superman is, for me, a weird character. Um, he is like important historically, obviously, but he's also kind of this like supposed perfect human, perfect man, perfect American. And he's super white and super male and he's super everything, um, but he's actually an alien, he's not human. He's from Krypton, um, so it's weird. <laughs> um, but he also has a really complicated and interesting history. Sometimes he's actually like fighting against fascism. Sometimes he's actually used for propaganda, like in World War II. Um, but always he is a conflicted character because while he's supposed to represent this perfect America, um, he is not from this planet. And so I think the fact that he is just historically embedded in what we understand as American comics makes comics this really interesting space to think through conflicting ideas. I'm using the word conflicting too much, I'm gonna to try to stop. All right, so here's a newer one, Chris Pratt. We've got Star-Lord, everybody, has anybody seen Guardians of the Galaxy? Oh, yeah. Good, so I'm not gonna do spoilers when I tell you he's half alien, half human. Sorry, I ruined that. <laughs> it's not like the biggest reveal, but I don't know, okay, it is. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so he's half human, half alien, and it's portrayed to us like it's this futuristic space, but in fact, he, Earth is in its current time, and he just like travels really quickly to a different galaxy that is like way far ahead of us in colonizing space and having mixed planets and all of this. Um, but his group, the Guardians of the Galaxy, are all alien with the exception of the genetically altered raccoon. Um, I, I'm actually not clear if he's from Earth or not, <laughs> or if there's raccoons on different planets. Um, but yeah, he's, this whole group is very interesting in the different renditions of like what characteristics we see as human placed in different bodies, including like a slightly talking tree, a raccoon who talks a lot more than the tree. Um, yeah, and all these different things, and obviously they're awesome show, uh, movies, so. All right. So here's where I'm gonna transition into my own research a little bit. Uh, I'm just putting that up because I think that's funny. Um, but yeah, there wasn't a lot of talk about some female characters. That's something that's really important to me. Comics are oftentimes a very masculine space, but it's not necessarily true um, anymore. Um, so one thing I look at my research particularly at is image comics. Does anybody know image comics? Yeah. You don't, if you know Walking Dead, you know Image Comics. Um, Image Comics is the third largest publisher in the United States, and it's awesome. And what made it even more awesome, at, like post Walking Dead, is that it's primarily a creator-owned source of comics. So what that means is instead of like Marvel and DC, where they go and work for a big industrial comic producer and they don't own any kind of creative, pro creative product that comes out of it, Image, if you publish with them, you own that creative product. Um, and that also gives options, oh no, okay. Um, that also gives options for people that sometimes are left out of those spaces and creative choices. Um, women, people of color, queer folk, like it can not only explore different sites of uh, financial options for them, but it can also make more creative speak, uh, stories. So I, absolutely adore image. So one of the ones I love is Monstrous. Yeah, I love Monstrous. Okay, so it's written by Marjorie Liu and drawn by Sana Takada. They are two of the most fantastic pairs out there in my personal opinion. Um, so in general, it follows this character, Maika, um, in this imagined futuristic Asian landscape that also is a matriarchal world, so that's cool, but it's not a utopian matriarchal world. It is actually very violent and very war-torn, and it's got a lot of complications racially. Um, so it's humans against non-humans, and she exists in this non-human space, um, but she looks human. But what makes her really, really interesting, other than she's just a fantastic, uh, strong character, is that her body has been 
um, merged with this other species that is possibly alien, possibly God. We're not really sure yet. The series is ongoing. Um, and she navigates that because she can't be taken over by it, but also she can't be rid of it. And it does give her stronger power um, physically and telekinetically and all of these different things. Um, so she's kind of, in my mind, existing in like a weird in-between. She's kind of mutated, like her strength is mutated, um, but she's linked both physically and historically. It's weird, there's a long backstory I won't get into, with this creature, so she's almost a cyborg. And he is potentially alien, which makes her potentially alien in this space. Um, and so she and he are trying to exist in a world that wants both of them dead. And they're navigating this, but she also hates him, and he hates her. And it's just, it's this weird, weird, very weird comic that's also really fantastic. And it's thinking through what it means to um, exist in a space that you don't have full control, but you're fighting for that control. And I think comics is a is a really good space for that kind of conversation. So, another one which maybe people know a little bit more is Saga. Um, Saga was started in 2012. It's ongoing, it's actually only halfway through, so we've got a, another maybe six years of it. Um, it's a, called an epic space opera, so it fits into that category a lot, like Star Wars. And um, it's written by Brian K. Vaughan, drawn by Fiona Staples. Fiona Staples is one of my favorite artists out there. I will say, even though it looks cute with the little seal and it looks family friendly, do not show this to kids, maybe not under 18. It's one of the most rated R comics I've read. Um, but it's fantastic. So the primary story of this is it follows Marco and Alana, who are over there on the edge, and they are from warring races, the wings and the horns. And it sounds like a football team, but it's much more serious than that. And they have a daughter, Hazel. And she is not only illegal in this universe, she is also thought to be impossible. And so now all sides want her dead. So it's following this family that's picking up characters along the way and losing characters along the way um, and trying to no negotiate the space of familial love, um, of understanding, of acceptance, of there's like a ton of really cool characters that come in and out. Um, yeah, but there's also just a ridiculous amount of violence, so just be cautious. <laughs> um, yeah, and so my, my research is really interested in, in looking at image as this creative space that allows for a lot more creative control for one, but also that means like more exploration in gender, gender, sorry, genre bending. Um, Saga, for instance, actually likes to play with genre, so it'll do a whole line of like Western styles of, um, traditional like sci-fi style of romance style and it just plays with it and it's just a very creative space. How am I in time? Okay, so I'm actually gonna end now. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for letting me talk to you and <laughs> I am finished. <laughs> this program was recorded on June 14th, 2018 at Top of the Park in Ann Arbor, Michigan.